Dwayne Shears' death, uh, Leonard Shears was released from the hospital here on Thursday. Um, he will be traveling to Chattanooga to have a follow-up surgery there that, that should uh, help his condition grow. Um, Gloria, a friend of Roy Clark, needs prayers uh, since her cancer returned. Paul Basemeyer's sister Robin is having exploratory surgery on Tuesday. Um, Carol Johnson is back in the area recovering from stroke. She's living right across the street. Please continue to remember her and your prayers. Um, please uh, continue to pray for uh, Ruth Lemon's daughter, Judy, who has been in the ICU at Cleveland Clinic. And also Kathy Simmons. She's now living in North Carolina with her daughter recovering from a stroke. Um, Margaret O'Dell still having difficulty with her hip and walking. Mark Berry, who's an elder at North End Church, is recovering from eye surgery and may need further surgery. Um, Rhonda Facemeyer's sister Nancy is recovering from the surgery she had. Gary Waggle, the brother of Carolyn and Janice, is waiting for the CAT scan result uh, for a swollen place on his chest. And the eldest sister, Linda Nixon, is having some health problems and has asked for prayers. And Oakley is back home. Glad to hear that. Please remember all these people in your prayers. Is there anyone that I've overlooked? Okay. Um, I hadn't taken time to talk to Elvis or Ed about this, but um, we we had talked previously in the in one of the elders and preachers meeting. We was going to have another update uh, just on general or in general and what's going on with the congregation, um, and then we had some other conditions arise, as as Elvis has already mentioned. The room and some other things. Um, so I'm going to do that next Sunday uh, after morning worship. If you'll plan to stay for just a few minutes, uh, shouldn't take too long. Uh, but just a general update on what's going on uh, here at the congregation. Um, July 23rd, next Sunday, after morning worship, we'll have a potluck meal. Everyone's invited to stay for that. Please plan on staying. I promise I won't make you wait too long for we. Um, uh, Tuesday, July 25th, will be the Digging Deep podcast at 8 o'clock. And July 30th, the Traveling Youth Group will be at Latrobe Street at 6, um, August 2nd, 3rd, August the 7th, I'm sorry, will be the next Elders and Preachers meeting. If there's something that you need to have brought up uh, during that time, please see myself, Ed, or Elvis, and we will try and deal with it during that meeting. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? Dwayne's going to be leading our singing this morning. Everybody join in. Must needs go home by the way.
and for observances, character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. sick wherever they may be and all of them who are not here present this morning because of their illness so we ask you to be with them bring them back to a better state of health let them return to be with us we ask you also father to be with all those who are not here because of other things <coughs> something can be said or done this morning to help them come back and we thank you, Father, for everything you do for us, because we know all good things come from you. We love you, and would you forgive us if we have sinned, dear Father? These things we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. 
Again, we have an opportunity to surround this table for take of these emblems. Um, in a moment, I'm going to read a passage of scripture. If you want to read along, First Peter chapter one, verses three through five. Um, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he instituted this memorial feast and uh, told his disciples uh, that uh, as often as they partake of this to remember him, his sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection. Because if he had not resurrected from the dead, we would have no hope of resurrection. And that's what we remember when we surround this table and partake of these emblems. Uh, you know, when we learn anything, uh, much repetition is, is involved, you know. Uh, we were learning on multiplication tables. So we have to go over it and over it and over it, you know, if we want to retain that in our memory. Uh, memory verses in your Bible. You have to spend some time committing those to, to memory. So the more we think about things, uh, then the more ingrained that gets in our psyche, you know. And that's why God in his wisdom established this to be uh, participated in every Lord's Day, every first day of the week uh, by those uh, of the faith. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. For taking this Memorial Feast not only reminds us of the great love that God had for us and the great love that Jesus had for us and their unthinkable sacrifice uh, to pay our sin debt. But we, we know that as Jesus was resurrected, we have confidence that God will resurrect us on the last day. And it says that he keeps us until then. If we will just stay near to him. So let's uh, give thanks now for the, for the bread. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are our God, that you have loved us, Father, that you have chosen us. We thank you for this bread that represents the, the body of your son that hung on that cross, Father, that uh, through his death paid our sin debt. We pray, Father, that you bless us now as we partake of this. In Jesus' name.
this will continue on things from the conclusion of the Father in heaven, we're so thankful uh, that we have this opportunity to surround this table and partake of these emblems, Father, that represent uh, uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine that represents his blood that was shed on that cruel cross, the blood that washes away the sins of the world, Father. We ask that you bless each of us now as we partake of this. In Jesus' holy and precious name. That concludes this portion of the worship service. We're also commanded once uh, on the first day of the week to lay by in store, if you have not done so already and wish to, is a, uh, a basket on the table as you exit the uh, auditorium. Thank you. land of poverty.
for me last Sunday night and, and filling in on Wednesday night while I went off to camp. It was a very successful week out of camp and if you had donated towards that effort, we appreciate that so much. Uh, we had 55 campers ages 7. I had four 7 year olds uh, through, actually I ended up with uh, I think 4 or 5 12 year olds. So I had everything in between and, and so we just had a wonderful week. I've done camp uh number of years here i don't know how many i did camp uh 12 years in florida out of all the weeks i've ever done this was probably the best behaved kids that i've ever had so that uh, now 99.9 percent .9 of them come from christian homes um so that was helpful i guess in, in that task um, we moved the camp from um this Ohio Valley Christian Youth Camp kind of moved it out of the Ohio part of the valley into the West Virginia part of the valley. But it was a Camp Provida over uh, in Waterford area, and now it is at Camp Bar, up in Worth County. And, and so we, uh, some of the local kids we would get from that area, we don't quite get anymore, but we'll maybe build some out there as time progresses. But it was a very successful week. Our, our theme was to be an example out of 1 Timothy 4, in verse 12 um, and so we uh, Doug was one of the ministers of Camden Avenue was my uh, co-director uh, many wonderful staff people even Ben and Zach came down or Ben and, yeah, ben and Abby came down for the week and I hope you're next, hopefully next year we'll get both of Ben and Zach down for the week and we just had a great week and we appreciate your support and, and our ability to go and, and do that uh, wonderful, and one of the elders of Kevin Ever called it a mission work, and so that's kind of what it is because we teach them a lot of Bible uh, during the week that we have uh, with them. So, tribulation, we don't like that word, do we? It means troubles, times are bad, but the Apostle Paul says tribulation produces perseverance. 
Perseverance means I'm going to keep going no matter what happens to me. It's like running a race and, and your legs begin to get tired and you begin to get thirsty and all those things. And, and, and you say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to keep going no matter what's happening to me. And you do. So perseverance produces character. And the character produces hope. Well, we're going to stop by that word character this morning and spend some time talking about character. And our person that we will talk about is Esau from the book of Genesis. Now, it's interesting because we don't talk a whole lot about Esau. And sometimes we do talk about character. And so we need to look at what is the value of character. What is the value? Now, now, the root idea of character is that of moral strength and courage. And so we can look at a person and say, this person is a, has a good, good characteristics about them. Or this other person, well, maybe not so good. You can see them doing things that, that may be lying, stealing, uh, lying, stealing, cheating, and, and different things that maybe you might say, well, their character isn't so good. But another person you might look at and say, well, their, their character seems to be, to be great. They seem to have a wonderful character. But here we see in a biblical aspect of Carol, character is moral strength and courage. In other words, courage to do things, courage to live the right way in a world that maybe that doesn't work so well. <coughs> here, when we define the word in its original language, what we see it means approved or, or tried character, a, a proof, a, a specimen of, of tried worth. And so men of faith develop this strength, this character to stand when the strong desire within us beckons another path. In other words, we, we stand firm in the gospel when the world is telling us to go all these different ways. So this morning, we're going to look at three things. First, we're going to look at the advantages of Esau. Then we're going to look at his obsession. Because let's face it, if anything's going to pull us away from where we go, it's being obsessed with something. And in our world, in our time, we get obsessed with a lot of things. So third, we'll look at obsessions of our time period. And certainly we have a few of those and how we can improve on those obsessions. But well, I want you to notice that Esau had godly parents. Isaac and Rebekah were his parents. And, and, and certainly that was important to have godly parents. And, and if you, you were godly parents and you have a child, well, that's a wonderful thing. I, I read this morning, actually, that the parent's most important job is to make sure their child gets to heaven. If you've done that, then you've done the most important job of being that parent. And I, I amen. I, I said, I agree with that. That's your most important job as a parent. So here we have Isaac and Rebecca. And, and then we have Isaac was the beloved son of Abraham. We sing that song, Father Abraham, many sons, many sons and Father Abraham. You are one of them, and so am I. And, and so here, Isaac was a direct son of Abraham. And, and so God identified himself with Moses as being the God of Abraham. Notice with the Acts chapter 7 and verse 31. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And he drew near to observe the voice of the Lord and, and came to him saying, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dare not look. But we're recounting the, in Acts, we're going back to the early days of recounting the burning bush. Can you imagine seeing God in the burning bush? And here's what God says, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses just kind of trembled and he, he didn't want to look into that. Now, unfortunately, both Isaac and Rebecca became divided. Now, here's, you can say, well, you know, you got mom and dad, and if mom and dad are getting along, life is good. 
But you know, mom and dad have a little tiff and they become the divide. Now, now, married couples, every married couple here will probably tell you, well, we've had many tiffs and our many disagreements in our marriage. And there's levels of disagreements in marriage, aren't there? And where it's just like, well, you know, this little argument or whatever, and, and 10 minutes later we're over it, or 15 minutes later, or maybe the next day, maybe it's a major argument, it takes the next day, and, and things are back to normal, and we, we apologize to each other, and we get back to where it should be. But, but here, the argument is over children. Now be careful. Because sometimes we take children and put them above our spouse. And that shouldn't happen. I've heard that husband and wife stay together just for the children. Well, I, we should stay together, yes. But we shouldn't just put the children up and say we're doing everything for the children. That's not the way God designed the plan. And by doing, putting children higher up than they should be, we're kind of saying, God, we don't like the way you designed the plan, so we're going to change it. So now we have this division between mom and dad, Isaac and Rebecca, because one likes one son and one likes the other son. And because of that, there's division in their marriage. So you can really have more than one division here. Now you're pitting brother against what? Brother. They say, well, how bad can that be? I'm going to tell you how bad that can be in just a moment. That can be disastrous for generations. You say, well, what do you mean? I'll follow along. We'll see. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 28 says this. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, this division had a, a, ter a terrible consequence. Parents need to have unity to give the greatest strength to the ch character of the children. Remember, we're talking about character. Now, now you're going to pass the parents are going to, we always say the apple doesn't fall far from the what? Tree. So you're going to pass these qualifications or these characteristics from parent to child. Now, now, we all have characteristics that we probably say, well, that's a bad habit or bad characteristic. And we don't want our children to do this one particular thing that we might do. But, you know, when we pass these down, guess what gets passed down? Both good and what? Bad. Everything falls down the tree, so to speak. And, and so here we have these two parents that, that have these bad, they started out as wonderful parents. So you have to wonder, where did something go wrong in this division? And it probably was in the communication between Rebecca and Isaac. They weren't on the same page, and they lifted up the children to a spot they should have lifted them up to. They made the children more important in the relationship than they should be. And of course, this led to something that, that, that happens, deceit, bitterness, and separation. Now you kind of see this pattern going. And just, if it was just deceit, if it was just bitterness, if it was just separation, that might go on for a generation or two. <laughs> if it was just those things, we say, well, those are horrible things. When there's deceit in a relationship, that's bad. When there's bitterness in a relationship, when there's separation, that's bad. Well, let's look at it. Esau was the firstborn. And because he was the firstborn, he was entitled in, 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 in to the birthright. In other words, the, the oldest son got the birthright, got the, the, the two-thirds of the assets of the family when the parents died. The younger son would get one-third of the assets of the family. And actually, the, all the children that are left would get one-third. And, of course, this meant double the share of the inheritance for the firstborn. So the firstborn kid, even though he, you know, in, in any case, even if he's a second or a minute ahead of the other child, that he would qualify for this type of thing. And, and that's just the way custom was in that day and time. Now, because he was the direct descendant of Abraham, 
there was some spiritual aspects involved here. It's not just personal property, it's spiritual too. And so we see this in Genesis chapter 12. I will make a great, you a great nation. Okay, this is God talking to who? Abraham. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of your earth shall be blessed. So we're, we're starting to go down these generations, these families of the earth. There. So there's a blessing there. And God had blessed Esau greatly. And God, uh, God's prophecy of Isaac and Esau was of their descendants. So you certainly see that there. And, and so when we see this, Genesis 25, and the Lord said to her, two nations, Okay, Rebecca, you're pregnant. So the Lord saw this coming. In your stomach, in your belly are two nations. You know, we go to a doctor, they do the ultrasound, and, and you know, the doctor looks up, so there's one heartbeat there. And, oh, 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 what's that? What's that? That's another heartbeat there. Oh, oh, you're having twins. Two little babies. And as the, the technology goes on and the date moves forward, they're able to see more. They'll say, well, one is a boy. And the other, in this case, another one is a boy. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall separate from your body. Now, one people, one person, shall be stronger than the other one. That's normal stuff, isn't it? Well, when Ben and Zach was born, Ben didn't have as much blood as, as Zach did, so Zach was, you know, bigger and stronger and taller and way more and all those types of things. The older shall serve the younger. Of course, Zach was the older by two minutes. And, and, and so you, you see this, these things about Esau. So you put him as a, a wonderful person. Now we move on to see his obsession. Now what happened? Now the story goes like this in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 29 through 34. Now Jacob cooked a stew. Yes, Jacob was a pretty good cooking food. Esau came in from the field and he was weary. He was tired. He was hungry. He, you know how it is when you come in from a hard day and, and you feel like you've just given it your all and he's just you know, hungry and tired. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. Okay. Esau asked for some of the stew. They named him Edom. Now, Edom developed into a nation. Remember, two nations are in your womb. We call them the Edomites. The Edomites are a nation that would cause Israel trouble all the way to the Babylonian captivity. And it would take the Babylonians to destroy the Edomites. Isn't that something? You ever have something bother you? Like, I can't get the stone out of my shoe. It's just there. It's just there. That's the Edomites, the Israel. They would be there to be a thorn in their side for all these years. Out of the seven nations, when Jacob is told, or when, excuse me, when Joshua is told to go into the land of Canaan and destroy, one of those nations are what? The Edomites. And so here, because of this disagreement become these children, because the mother and the father couldn't get along, you're going to see a nation that, that is not well. Verse 31, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. So he, he saw an opportunity. We're not going to go through this whole story, but he saw an opportunity to take advantage of his brother. Now his mother, the mother loves Jacob. The mother is all into this. The mother is, if you read the whole story, you see that the mother is into this trickery of tricking the father. 
The mother is into pulling the wool over the father's eyes. So she's into promoting the son and really abandoning her husband and abandoning her other son. The, fa other, the, the father is into Esau and looking at him. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. We'll look at that in just a second. So what is the birthright to me? That Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold him. That's one of those, in my day, we'd spit on our hands. You ever do that? You ever then you shake the person's hand, you both spit on your hands. Look, we have a deal. That, that, that's what they're doing here. They're, that we swear to me that this is not sure. Yes, I, I'm going to give you a, some of the stew. You're going to give me your birthright because I am so weary and so tired from being out in the field that I think I'm going to die. And Jacob gave Esau bread and, and the stew of lentils. He ate, he drank, he arose, he went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Well, Esau, I want you to notice, has made a choice based on a temporary obsession. You know, things that we are obsessed with today might be gone tomorrow. You ever notice that? Think of what was important to you in 19, I don't know, 80. I know some of the young people were so being born was important to me in 1980 because I wasn't born in the 2000, well, you know, I understand that. But those of us who are older that remember 1980, think to you, well, remember 8-track? That was kind of important to me. I remember installing an 8-track in my sister's, ready for this, Pinto. <laughs> you know, I thought we had the Pinto, we had the 8-track, and, and, and what else did we put in there? We put a CB in there. We were styling. Things that were important back then are, you know, have you seen a Pinto lately? If they haven't rusted out or what, you know, I think they're pretty much, you find one, it's very rare. You know, they're pretty much gone and flattened and everything else. Things that were important back then, they, they're not around anymore. And they were temporary. How much stuff, you know, the things that are important today, when we think of our cell phones, they're so important to us. I saw a preacher, he's not a Church of Christ preacher, but he said this, and I don't know if it's facts or true, but I believe he's pretty close. He says the average person has six hours of screen time a day on a telephone. He said Generation X has nine. So our young people basically are spending nine hours a day attached to their phone, looking at their phone, and the rest of us, me included, I guess, are spending six. And then the preacher said, just think how much that would be if we'd open our Bibles for that amount of time a day. That'd be a big difference, wouldn't it? What we're obsessed with, and I, by the way, in, in 10 years, I don't think we're going to be obsessed with ourselves. I think there'll be what? Something else. Well, I don't know what it will be. If I knew what it would be, I could make some money at it, I guess. But there will be something else that will, will, will take our attention away from that. I remember the first time we got beepers. I, I got my beeper. I, I would have had the suit coat on. I'd have it uh, hanging out. Oh, there's my beeper, you know, on my side. I must be what? Important because people need to get a hold of me. I've got a beaver. You know, things we're obsessed with today are just temporary and they go away. And there's two ways of thinking about decisions or making decisions. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on what? These temporary, these fleshly things. The things that will expire, the things that will go their way. But those who live according to the Spirit... The things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life. To be spiritually minded is life. And with that comes peace. So because of Esau's carnal mind, he despised that what would be. His case was truly valuable. And when we treat God's things lightly, we'll be careful. When we treat God's things 
life. God's time, God's book, all those things about God, we despise them. Well, the characteristics of Esau, one of the two things there is that when we look at his obsession, first, compulsive preoccupation. There's that big word, preoccupation. In other words, preoccupied with a fixed item or an unwanted feeling or emotion are often accompanied by a symptom of anxiety. He's preoccupied by being what? Hungry. Well, we all get hungry, don't we? What are you willing to pay for your food? What are you willing to give away for your food? What, and here he's given something precious, which is his birthright. Well, secondly, a compulsive, often unreasonable idea or emotion. Oh, watch that word emotion. When we get emotionally invested in different things, that's a whole new thing that's almost we can't control sometimes. How do you control that emotion? So here's the question. We read that verse. Esau says, I'm about to what? Die. So here's the question. Does anybody here really think he was about to die? Yeah. Now, was he hungry? Yes. Was he tired? Was he thirsty? Was he all these things? Yeah, sure. I, we can understand that. But certainly he wasn't about to die. The, the strong desire for something causes one to believe a lie. A desire for something. We see that certainly in our word, world today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 11, verses, verses 11 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe what? A lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in ungodliness. So we have to ask the question, how many Christians have been seen Give up heaven for obsession. Now, <clears throat> obsession has no concept of waiting. Does it? I want this. No. There's nothing in this word. There's no, well, wait five years and you'll get this or whatever. Wait two years. It's just having it now. We live in a world, and all of us kind of get used to this. We want, if we want something, we want it now. And so that's our kind of thinking. And, and, and obsession has, will, will not pay, or will pay any price for whatever it is. And this particular uh, Esau will not pay any price for food and drink. Any price. It didn't matter the price, and he would have paid it, certainly did. And we know that obsession is very powerful. Obsession cannot see the future and its consequences. So as Ephesians 4 and verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Put that old person off. Put those old characteristics off, if you will. Put on those new characteristics. Be the type of person that you should be. Genesis 27, verse 41. So Esau hated who? His brother Jacob. Because of the blessing which his father blessed him with. Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Watch this. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. This sounds like another brother relationship, doesn't it? Where we back up in the Bible and go to Genesis chapter 4. What other brother was willing to kill his brother? Because of really miscommunication. Remember when we started out, we said, well, well what was the beginning of this problem? This problem was began the parents, Isaac and Rebecca, and miscommunication between the two of them, and then it dribbled down to their sons and miscommunication between the two of them. 
Same thing at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 4. Uh, uh, miscommunication between the two of them. Well, we come to our generation. I'll mention a couple things this morning and then we'll be done. One is the desire of sex before marriage. They've done a lot of studies on couples that live together before marriage. And the numbers are astronomically high. So you, can, you can look this up, Google it, or whatever you do to find it. The numbers are, if you live with somebody before you're married to them, and have sex with them before you're married to them, the chances are around 80% that that marriage will fail. They're, they're astronomically high. I don't make those numbers up. I have nothing to do with those numbers. Those numbers are just what they are. Why? Because God designed things a certain way. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, marriage is honorable. Marriage is honorable. Living together, having sex without marriage is not honorable. The bed is undefiled. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. What about the desire for material things? Well, how about the desire for revenge? Well, they did this to me, so I'm going to get them back with this. Is that going to help anything? No. Is that going to make things worse? Probably. Desire for attention. Here's one. I'm just going to take a little bit. It's not going to hurt. The desire for alcohol and drugs. That'll get you in trouble, Flip. If you don't think that this is a problem, open your eyes. Look around at the many, the many alcohol and drug treatment rehabilitation places that are in Parkersburg alone. There's not one, there's not two, there's not three, there's not four, there's not five. There are many. There are so many that the, 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 the city council and things like that are, are saying they don't want anymore. So it's a problem that we need to address. There's a desire for that. We, we need to help with that. Well, how do we overcome these things? First, we build a character that pleases God. Remember, I said we, we have a couple characteristics here. You know, one person might have good characteristics, another person might have not so good character. We, we build that person up to have these good characteristics. And if that is us, that is ourselves, we build them up. Now we keep thinking, number two, well, what do you keep thinking? Philippians chapter four, verse eight says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, you think what's true, what's true is the word of God. Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, what, in other words, pure, pure is holy, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy or worthy of praise, think about these things. You see, it's a change of focus uh, to, to, from the worldly things, thinking about spiritual things. God wants us to think about spiritual things. God wants our focus on spiritual things, not doing the things of the world. If we do those, we need to get away from those as quick as we can. Number four, maintain proper worship with God. John chapter 3, verses 20 says this, For everyone practicing evil hates the light, it does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Well, finally, here's the question. Who is going to control your life? Who is going to control? Well, we have to make a decision. Joshua would say he would make a decision. He says, Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, I make a decision for me. I make a decision for my wife. I make a decision for my children. Now, if Isaac would have done the same thing that Joshua would have done, it would have been a lot better. But what they did is they started out right, but there became problems where they divided up in their marriage. They didn't get their communication back together. And from that became two nations. 
one of those nations that was horrible, years and years of death and destruction, it finally had to be destroyed by the only one that probably could destroy him, and that's through the power of God, was the Babylonians. Both Genesis 27, verse 38. And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing? You see, he gave that blessing to Jacob. Because of trickery with the wife and and, and, and and the meal and everything else, he gave it to his brother. Esau says, Bless me. Oh, my father. I want you to notice this. Esau lifted up his voice. Was Esau strong? Yes. He, he, although he seemed to be weak at this point, but when he came in from the field, he was hungry, he was weak, he was thirsty, he was, you know, spit. And so he was weak enough to sell. You know, when does sin attack us? When we're strong, when we just get out of church, and, and, and when we come back from camp, and, and we're lifted up spiritually, and you think sin's waiting there? To, 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 absolutely. And certainly, if we become weak, sin will move in quicker and quicker and quicker to attack us. Sin will wait for the opportune moment to attack us. And Satan is waiting, waiting to do that to you and I. But we can stand strong against him. We can build up our character. And if we're going to be obsessed with something, make it something of God. Not something of the world. Something of God. This morning we offer the Lord's invitation. You know, the Lord's invitation is really one word. And that word is come. You see it in the book of Revelation, the spirit and the bride say, come. Come, you are weary and heavy laden. You need to be baptized to become a member of the, of, of the family of God, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You repent of your sins and you confess them before men and you're ready to be baptized, have your sins washed away. The Spirit will say, come. If you need prayers or to be uplifted, and, and we'll certainly, you know, God answers prayer. He certainly does that. We'll pray with you and pray for you. Won't you come as we stand as we stand? Someday you'll stand at the water on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of why. What will your answer be? What will it be? Prepare my friend, make it.
see everyone out this morning. We'd certainly like to see everybody back this evening for evening worship service. I'd also like to thank Elvis for a good lesson this morning. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? If you'll bow with me, we'll have a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we're grateful for this day that you've given us. We pray, Father, that the things said and done here this morning were pleasing in your sight. We pray, Father, that as we leave this place, that you will be with each of us. That you'll give us safe passage to our uh, homes. And Father, we pray that you'll bring us all back, back together at the next appointed time. Father, we ask for your guidance as we go about our daily lives. Help us, Father, always to be shining your light to those around us. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.